and recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another day of debate in the Legislature, to all those who are tuned in at home, watching online, uh, and those who have joined us in the public gallery. I see a couple of familiar faces here, Roxanne Carter-Thompson from the Adventure Group, and doing some amazing work at the Outreach Centre as well, and Karen Cumberland. Uh, who is here representing the PEI Alliance for Wellbeing? I think about a year old now, or close to it. So, uh, thank you both for being here. Hope you enjoy the proceedings, and thank you for the wonderful work you've been doing on behalf of all Islanders. It's, uh, it's good to see you here. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin my remarks by saying uh, and recognizing that today, December the 1st, is World AIDS Day. Uh, it's a day when we unite to show solidarity in the fight against HIV AIDS. Uh, and while we're encouraged about the efforts uh, that have been made in the advancement of treatment and the work towards an eventual cure, uh, we also mourn and reflect on those who've lost their lives during this terrible uh, epidemic. Uh, I also want to take the time, and we should take the time, to celebrate the activists who continue to work so hard uh, to bring attention to this uh, HIV AIDS issue at a time uh, uh, in the not too distant past when they were being ignored or worse, discriminated against, Mr. Speaker, but they, uh, they continue to uh, promote goodness and kindness. And I think of here on Prince Edward Island, I see local filmmaker Dave Stewart uh, will release a documentary tonight called uh, Positive. Uh, when HIV AIDS hit Prince Edward Island. That's showing tonight at City Cinema at 7 p.m. And I know Dave as one of the funniest people in, in PEI, really. I, he has a great sense of humor. Uh, I sometimes think there aren't enough people who share the sense of humor that perhaps Dave and, and me do, but uh, this is a pretty heavy topic he's taken. But I know, Dave, uh, that he will do this well, and I see that uh, uh, Troy Perot Sanderson, who was someone I went to high school with, is, is featured in it as well. Uh, so if you can get out tonight, uh, please go to attend that. I want to thank the Peers Alliance for presenting this project tonight and to thank them for their ongoing work uh, uh, to try to uh, reduce the stigma and help uh, those uh, with AIDS and HIV, Mr. Speaker. I also want to say that uh, to offer my congratulations to uh, the the A team at uh, the Senior A Boys team at Ecole Sur Mer, Mr. Speaker, who for the second year in a row have won the PEI School Athletic Association uh, A Championship uh, under the guidance of teacher coach Austin Stord. It seems like that small school in Summerside is building a bit of a dynasty, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and MVP Carson Crawford said it was a great way to finish his school career with back-to-back -back championships. So to all those at Ecole Sur Mer, I say congratulations and keep up the great work. I was also interested, someone sent me a text yesterday with a, a link to CBC to watch uh, a little story called Magic the Gathering, Mr. Speaker, which uh, featured uh, uh, Wyatt Gillis and Marcus King, who happens to be a nephew of mine, Mr. Speaker, and Marcus lives in Charlottetown. I don't get to see him as much, but it was great to see him on TV. And this wonderful, yeah, it was on Compass, yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, this game that uh, I don't know much about, but they, they described it as Dungeons and Dragons meets Texas hold him poker, uh, and Marcus was one of the people who uh, finished high enough to go to a national championship in Toronto next year, so it was a great story. Uh, he seemed to know a lot about the, the game, and I was, uh, I said, I haven't seen him for a little while, but I sent him a note to tell him how articulate he sounded. I, I thought that uh, maybe there's a brighter future for him somewhere along the way, Mr. Speaker, so congratulations, and thanks CBC uh, and Jane Robertson for that story. Mr. Speaker, the 2023 Confederation Center of the Arts uh, announced their new 2023 uh, uh, schedule. Uh, Maggie, a musical starring Johnny Reed, will be on the main stage, Mr. Speaker, and this is a creation. Uh, uh, but the team behind Telltale Harbor, who've done a great job uh, uh, actually with that play, so I look forward to learning more about that. And there's also uh, the play that uh, I think it says goes round. I don't know, Mr. Speaker. I uh, can't read my own handwriting, but it's Sherlock Holmes meets Monty Python. So once again, that sounds like it's going to be very interesting. And at the Mac, uh, we have uh, I'm Every Woman, which is a review of songs of, uh, of a number of vocalists, including Aretha Franklin, Dolly Parton, uh, Chaka Khan, Taylor Swift, and others. And I was very happy and surprised, and as a proud dad moment, to see that the Kitbag Theatre production of the songs of Johnny and June, uh, by, with uh, Rebecca Parent as director, uh, Melissa McKenzie, and my own Jacob Hempel as, as the lead singer, Mr. Speaker. I saw this uh, production this summer. Uh, it's fantastic. I'm proud of uh, Jake and Melissa and Rebecca. 
uh, it's a great show uh, and uh, good for them to hit the big time, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, uh, as I say, a proud dad moment in here that I don't get so much uh, time to say. But, uh, Jake, you're doing a great job. Melissa, keep it up. So, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Don John of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've seen Jake and Melissa in that show and many other shows, and it's absolutely something to be proud of, Premier. You have a wonderful son there with a great voice. Um, I, too, would like to welcome Roxanne uh, and uh, also, oh my gosh, sorry, Karen. Sorry, Karen. Uh, to the uh, legislature today and everybody who's watching at home and I'm sometimes asked what life in the legislature is like and the, the Premier just described something as being uh, a, a, a combination of dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons and Texas Hold'em <laughs> Poker and sometimes that's what this place feels like there's some bluffing going on. He also said just about something else, again, I don't remember what it was, that it was Sherlock Holmes meets Monty Python, and we have that in here as well. <laughs> so it's a, it's, an, it's a strange place to try and capture in words. But every day I'm, I feel blessed to be here and to do the important work that I do with my 26 other colleagues in this Legislative Assembly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Nature Canada's Biodiversity Nature Bus Tour will be in Charlottetown this Saturday, and they're making their way to Montreal. There's a, a COP conference there, Biodiversity Summit in Montreal from December the 7th to the 19th, and they're making stops along the way, including one here on Saturday from 12 noon to 2 o'clock at the PEI Farm Centre on University Avenue, and it will be uh, no doubt a lovely event. We have COP summits for uh, climate change, of course, we just had one, but this is, this is one on biodiversity biodiversity and the Charlottetown stop here is hosted by Nature PEI and it's going to be uh, a family friendly event with refreshments information about species at risk and about conservation organizations on the island along with uh, opportunities to sign a postcard to send messages to the elected delegates who will be at COP15 in Montreal and of course there's a whole host of Christmas things upcoming including one uh, near where I live in Crapo, the Very Merry Christmas is on this weekend on Saturday with uh, main events on Sunday. A family skate at the, at the rink there in Crapo from 1 o'clock till 2 on Sunday afternoon, uh, which is always well attended. And at 6 o'clock, um, there's a holiday movie at the community hall. Now, it's a place which, is, which has shown movies for a very, very long time, and it's nice when that, when that comes back. There's a lot of other stuff happens, but there'll be a movie there at 6 o'clock on Saturday. And then finally, a carol sing and uh, lighting of the Christmas tree on, on Sunday evening. And later on tonight, Mr. Speaker, I will be joining a couple of my colleagues, one from Summerside Wilmot, one from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, at uh, a fundraising event at Backwoods Burger in Tyne Valley, a sold out fundraising event, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, uh, I'm hoping we finish on time today so we could get up there and we will uh, no doubt have good company and some lovely food. And before I sit down, Mr. Speaker, I have no idea what the future holds, of course, but if this should be the last day of the sitting here, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank the pages. We have three of the, the best pages with us today. Lovely to see you. Um, and the staff of this Legislative Assembly, uh, both those that we see on the floor here um, and also those who are working behind the scenes, the researchers and the folks at Hansard and on and on. And on. Thank you for that. And to yourself, Mr. Speaker, I want to personally thank you for your sage counsel and for your guidance and your fair but firm um, manner in which you, you keep this place in order. You, uh, you sometimes need to, you need to enforce yourself, and, and, but you do that with a way that allows for flexibility and therefore for some fun in this place. And I think that's why you have the deep respect of every member of this House, and I, I want to pass on my personal um, thank you for, for everything you've done over the years, Mr. Speaker. And finally, uh, and finally, Mr. Speaker, I'm blessed to work with some wonderful colleagues, both in this house and upstairs on the second floor of this building. Um, we have uh, a small but mighty team up there. Uh, people who work extraordinarily hard are very talented, they're smart, and they have kind hearts. And I want to thank each and every one of them for the way that they support the work that we do here in the legislature and they make it possible for us to have um, constructive, useful debates here in this legislative assembly. Thank you all. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to welcome everyone to the gallery. Special welcome to Roxanne and Karen, and everyone that's here today. You know, as the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition alluded to, you know, some days people ask us what it's like in here. Kind of like the Bugs Bunny cartoon, where the sheepdog and the coyote, every day, you know, they, they go to work and beat each other up and punch out at 4 o'clock and say, have a good night, see you in the morning. You know, like, and, 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 and you know, for a new person, it takes to be getting used to that because uh, it's kind of a battle for question period, especially. As you can see the other day there on uh, Tuesday, where we're supposed to be nice to each other, how that changed quite quickly during <laughs> question period. But anyway, Mr. Speaker, on a serious note, as the Premier mentioned and the Leader of the Opposition, today is World AIDS Day. A day to remember those who have lost, who, who we've lost to the disease, and to renew our efforts in not just fighting to end HIV, but to combat the stigma, stigma still endured by people living with the disease. As was mentioned, City Cinema in Cheryl Town is presenting a special screening tonight of a documentary on the subject, Positive, is about how AIDS affected Prince Edward Island when it was still a new disease. On World AIDS Day, I encourage Islanders to earn themselves with knowledge and work towards reducing stigma associated with this disease. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And also, there is rumor we could be done today. I'm not sure. You never know. Um, but in case we are, I too want to thank the Pages for all our hard work, the clerks, yourself, Mr. Speaker, all our colleagues. You know, as I said, we, we battle it out for a while in the day, but we're all human beings in here, and we all get along fairly well outside of here, and we see each other at functions, and it's a pleasure to go to these functions together. And uh, I just wanted to say that. And, uh, you know, it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to work with everybody. And Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I have a few more things I'd like to say. I don't think I'll go past my time. Mr. Speaker, it was a few weeks before Christmas and our final days in these seats when tensions high, when, with tensions high after a long five weeks. Here is a little poem to help turn down the heat. With your indulgence, let us take pause to see what's in our MLA's Christmas list to dear Santa Claus. The Greens, for the Greens is simple. They want coal for our landlords and policies implemented no matter the cost and maybe some answers about the development in Point de Roche. Santa won't need to look at the list for Charlottetown Winslow. You can see it in his glare and unlike his fellow backbenchers, asking for more hair. <laughs> What he wants for Christmas is to turn, is a turn in a cabinet seat. The Minister of Fisheries and Communities is a simple kind man who wouldn't find, you won't find him asking for a government with a plan. No. Santa knows this minister sure is a boaster, but yesterday we also learned he cooks a pretty good oyster. <laughs> Relaxation and rest is what the health minister needs. That's why he asked for chips, flashlights, and lavender seeds. <laughs> He will settle for the opposition to not heckle and for the contractors of the new mental health hospital to step on the paddle. Yes. The premier is, Premier's list is short. There's only a few. No more pandemics or hurricanes and maybe a gift card or two. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. Speaker, I didn't forget myself. I'd love to share what Santa could bring that will fill me with glee and that's a new Liberal government in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Who's your poet? <laughs> Who's your poet? <laughs> Stop. Well done. Well done. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wanted to rise today on World AIDS Day um, because for a lot of people we don't have um, a memory, perhaps a close memory of, of um, what it was like when AIDS became part of our lexicon. Um, I, I had a really good friend called David, David McHugh, who spent a number of years um, in the London Lighthouse, which was the very first centre and hospice dedicated um, for people with HIV and AIDS in England. It opened in 1986. 
Um, and when David first became a patient there, I volunteered there as well. And we would hang out and organize parties. There was lots of karaoke, which would make my friends happy, and dancing and costumes. And then when David got sicker and became a resident there, I, I kept volunteering so I could see him because his family wouldn't go. Um, it was a time when, um, if you had AIDS, um, people were afraid to touch you. They were afraid to hug somebody or share a toilet in case they caught it. Um, and David, when he passed, uh, which was in December of 1991, he was annoyed because Freddie Mercury died first, and it meant that Freddie Mercury got all the media. He was really annoyed about that. But um, his family wouldn't come um, to his funeral, and so the memorial service was held in the garden at London Lighthouse, and his ashes are still there. That's where he's buried. Um, and I think it's really important that if you don't I'm lucky enough to have had David in my life, and he's, he's someone who I really treasure a memory of my life with him, even though it was so long ago. But um, you know, when David Stewart shares his experience and his stories, it's really important that we go and we bear witness to stories that maybe we don't have a personal experience of to understand how different things can be when you don't fit. Um, and so, Mr. Speaker, you know, um, I, I, it's not at all a sad thing to have a great memory of a great friend and a great time, and that he was loved. Um, but it is also really important that we are always open to that learning. And uh, I really look forward to seeing the, um, the documentary um, that uh, David Stewart is sharing. Um, and on a happier note, or perhaps a lighter note, Mr. Speaker, I'm also looking forward to welcoming um, the community at a Christmas or holiday social maybe, with, that involves your favorite cookies, potentially eggnogs, so and maybe yeah. a member from Orlando Inverness might want to join us at the PEI Farm Center next Friday the 9th, and all are welcome, regardless of what they're wishing for for Christmas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This will be my last chance to greet online residents of Brighton before Christmas, so thank you so much for listening and, co and commenting directly to me. People in Brighton, like most other islanders, take great pride in their exterior Christmas displays. I am really looking forward to enjoying them all, uh, and a big thanks to Brighton, Brighton in advance for their efforts, and I wish them all a great holiday season. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so a few days ago, I was uh, I stood up here and I said some of the fantastic things, fantastic things happening at Lot 16 Hall, and I forgot one of them, one of the most important ones, the Lot 16 Hall um, online silent auction fundraiser, Mr. Speaker, that is happening very soon, and I'm I'm excited to say that there's over 150 items to bid on this year. So you can go to their uh, Facebook page and take a look at those items. That will be starting December 4th, and I'm. I'm also told that the uh, delicious fudge that has been featured at many events at Lot 16 Hall, as well as discussed several times now in the legislature, will be one of the items for purchase on that sale. So I encourage everyone to have a look. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Trafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise. Well, welcome to every, all my colleagues in the chamber today, to those joining us, um, and to everybody from Mermaid Stratford and the rest of the island that's tuning on, tuning in. But, Mr. Speaker, I got called out yesterday by my sister because I seem to always say hi to people in Mermaid Stratford, but I never say hi to my sister, who, yes, she watches every evening after she comes home from, from uh, teaching. And as you know, she can be, you know, um, good at basically giving marks out, as the Premier probably remembers. And, you know, she, first of all, was disappointed that she had to see the Premier reprimand us yesterday, because that's not, or sorry, the um, Speaker reprimand us yesterday, because she's like, that's not something that he ever really has to do. And so she felt bad for you having to do that. But she did mention somebody from across, on the other side of the floor there that really seems to be in tune with what's going on with everyday, everyday islanders, and that is the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure's Graham mother. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize um, a Charlottetown Rural, um, High, a Charlottetown Rural High School student um, who reached out to me today. Her name is Charlotte McNutt Lawson, and her grade 10 pre-IB um, IB class and uh, her 
team, her project team, they have invited me to attend um, a presentation on their project. And their project is about improving sexual health education in Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. That's a grade 10 class that is, uh, that is prioritizing the a province's sexual education program and not being good enough. And I want to just really give them a huge shout out um, of how they are really prioritizing it. And it just shows how much engagement we have in 16 year olds. And you know, someday soon, maybe they'll be able to vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alvin Wallace. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to give a shout out to all the great people that would be watching in from up in uh, District 26, Albert and Bloomfield. Uh, this coming Sunday afternoon, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be hosting uh, a public skate up at the Jock Cartier Arena from 1.30 to 3.30. Uh, ones from every political party are more than welcome to attend, and if you have no affiliation, you're still welcome to attend. Uh, rumor has it that the jolly old elf will be there. I'm not sure if you'll have all the treats that uh, the leader of, of the third party has referenced there, but maybe you'll have some. And just in uh, closing, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd certainly like to welcome and acknowledge Roxanne and Karen for being in the gallery here today. Thank you for your dedication and all the hard work that you do for Islanders. Thank you. Stratford Quebec. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll be uh, very brief. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was first elected in um, the fall of 2011, and uh, from the get-go, um, I like to believe that I was a strong advocate for uh, mental health and wellness here in PEI, and I'd like to recognize two individuals that have joined us here in, in the gallery today, Karen Cumberland with the PEI Alliance for Mental Health and Wellbeing, and Roxanne Carter-Thompson with the Adventure Group. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely, extremely proud and privileged to be part of a government that, that believes in working with NGOs to, to further um, um, the initiatives um, to, to help Islanders uh, with mental health and, uh, and other issues. And I applaud these organizations for the great work that you do in our communities and continue to do what you do, regardless of naysayers. You're doing wonderful work. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to recognize uh, a young lady from Prince Edward Island who is currently in Ottawa doing tremendous work on Parliament Hill. Uh, you'll all remember her, Hannah McClellan. She uh, came to the uh, legislative floor back a number of years ago and uh, presented a bill which uh, we renamed the bill Hannah's Bill. And uh, recently um, she attended uh, an, uh, an event on Parliament Hill with uh, senators, members of Parliament and uh, various other dignitaries to ensure that disability inclusion um, was being moved forward on a federal level as well. So I'd uh, really like to uh, say hello to Hannah and thank her for her continued work that uh, she continues to do. And last but not least, I'd like to send out a huge hello to a very good friend of mine, Danny Harris. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Do they miss anyone? No. Honourable members, I would like to stand too and recognize Roxine and, and Karen and all those in, uh, at home I'm watching from District 1. It's surprising how many events you go to and, and uh, how many people will actually tell you that they're, they're watching uh, online at home. So a big shout out to them. I'm not going to start naming names. I told them all that I would, you know, next time I'm up I'll uh, mention your name. But, I'll mention your name. I haven't got time to go through everybody's name. I only got 40 seconds to get through it here. And I'm not going to start thanking everyone just yet. I'll thank everyone at the last Charlotte so Carey. <laughs> just don't know what can happen here from day to day. <laughs> so pages, just have patience. I will thank you, and so I will have my time to thank everyone. Uh, there's one gentleman here in the gallery with us today, Jack Weeks. Jack's been with us uh, September as an uh, intern, internship, and he is leading us at the end of the month. And it's, you know, when you get these students in, it's sad to see them go, but as our mother said, we gotta let them go over under our wings and let them grow. <laughs> so we wish you luck into the, 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 the future, Jack, and uh, maybe someday we'll uh, see you uh, either at the clerk's table or the speaker chair or in a member's chair. 
So uh, carry on with your political career and looking forward to uh, you setting policies for me when I make it to the Calvo Manor in Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, and the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Legislative Assembly, it is our responsibility to ensure the voices of all Islanders are heard. And it is our responsibility to protect and advance the rights and well being of vulnerable, marginalized communities in all aspects of Prince Edward Island. Addressing ways to prevent and combat how our government policies and legislation allows room for systemic racism and discrimination to be present is part of that responsibility. With an amendment I brought forward to the Residential Tenancy Act, supported by all members of the House, I believe we made a positive step towards ensuring discrimination of any kind will not be tolerated in our PEI rental industry. But let me be clear, it is not good enough. The amendment allows for a tenant to break a lease a agreement after filing a complaint that provides evidence via a report from the Human Rights Commission that their landlord was discriminated against them. Today, tomorrow, and each day going forward, the, the, that we don't address the three-year backlog in cases in the PEI Human Rights Commission. This amendment will not protect the people it sets out to. I appreciate the Minister of Social Development and Housing working with me on this for Islanders, but we know as well um, as I do that the, that's not a perfect solution and does not go far enough in protecting the human rights of individuals today. Well, it is not a perfect solution, what gives me hope is that it can be. In order for this to happen, we must address the external factors limiting its abilities. We need to further increase our investments into st in investment into staffing Human Rights Commission and find ways to streamline the investigation process, because if we don't, some of our most vulnerable islanders will be harmed. The party, these parties in the House may not always agree on many things, but I know we all agree that we cannot stand by and allow this to happen, knowing that there is something we can do to prevent it. Well, I thank all members for their support. Our work is not done yet. So I also ask for your continued support in making this amendment something we can be proud of, and not just another clause in a piece of legislation with no substantial effect, but most importantly, to lead by example. Discrimination has no place in Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize all our island farmers who are innovative leaders in agriculture and use hard work, science and technology to sustainably produce the best food. In particular, I'd like to talk about uh, farmers Gordon and Andrea McKinnon in Newton. Uh, in fact, I heard from Gordy today, Mr. Speaker, and he and Andrea are currently in Ottawa as invited delegates to the Grow Canada 2022 conference where they are promoting PEI's leadership and adopting crucial agricultural sustainability practices. Mr. Speaker, Gord is a third generation farmer who manages Country View Farms with his parents Greg and Karen McKenna. They specialize in potatoes and other crops like forages and grains. But Mr. Speaker, new technology is something that Gord and Andrea are passionate about using to benefit their operation. For example, they use science and technology to predict when and where blight might happen and to lessen the amounts of protectant that they need to use on their crops. Also, Mr. Speaker, they own dialed-in precision ag services, which specializes in GPS grid oil, uh, soil sampling and site-specific SWAT mapping services. So this is automated soil sampling of thousands of points across the field, coupled with the associated location data, and it enables variable rate application of crop inputs, the precise application rate at precise locations. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, recently, Gordon and Andrea decided to diversify into carrots and turnips, and they founded the Bunny Burrow Vegetable Company. It is a true family business and was named by their children, Mr. Speaker. Gordon and Andrea's goal is to teach people that farming is one of the most important jobs in the world. They host farm tours, present at school events, and mentor young people. Mr. Speaker, I want to give a huge thank you to Gordon, Andrea, and family, great members of our PER farm community. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Mr. Speaker, across our province there are numerous organizations that are doing incredible work to serve and protect and assist and fill in gaps of the various needs of Islanders. Behind these incredible organizations and associations and NGOs, 
are even more incredible volunteers. Particularly during this time of year, we see Islanders stepping up in many capacities to help those in need during what can be a stressful and difficult time for some. There are too many organizations and people doing amazing work to start to list them all, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has and will be volunteering their time or resources during the weeks leading up to the holiday season. Whether it be volunteering at a local food bank, providing meals to those in need, raising funds to help sponsor families, Chris, a family's Christmas, or helping our vast array of island charities get through the busy time. Thank you for the work you are doing. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the first responders across this province as they begin to prepare for the many challenges the winter months bring for what they do. In particular, I want to give a big shout out to the dedicated volunteer firefighters on the Muskush Fire Department and the Wellington Fire Departments in my district. While many of us will be enjoying the holidays with friends and family, it's our volunteer first responders that will likely have to take, their time will be interrupted responding to calls of their fellow community members in an emergency. We say it all the time, but it can never be said enough. Thank you very much for your service. We are so fortunate to live in a province where we take care and look after one another, not just during a special time of year, but year round. It's one of the many things that makes living in this province so special. On behalf of the third party, I want to wish all Islanders safe, a safe and happy holiday season, as well as everyone in the Evangeline Squish District. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. As the years tick by in this administration, one thing is becoming clear. This is a government that cannot get things done. On three occasions recently, I asked the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning to commit to providing a low-interest loan for two rural childcare facilities so that their future can be secured. On all three occasions, the Minister failed to commit to this easy, low-risk fix to an urgent problem. In the flurry of pre-election goodies that was announced yesterday, 2% loans for other things were announced to great fanfare, mm -hmm. yet the Minister will not commit to a 4% loan to keep childcare services open in rural areas. A question to the Premier. Why isn't your government getting this done by providing these loans immediately before these childcare centres go under, taking children, families and the affected communities with them? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the question from the Honourable Leader. I think to reiterate what the Minister of Education has said is that we continue to work uh, with those two individual uh, child care centres to try to find some uh, ways to help them forward, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is a process in place. We don't stand in the legislature and say we're going to loan this company money. There's a process that would need to take place to go through Treasury Board, etc. Uh, when the Minister of Ed Education uh, indicated uh, that they were working hard with these individuals, Mr. Speaker, they are. And if we can get to a point where we can agree on something rather quickly, that's what we will do. But we do have to follow processes. I understand what the Honourable uh, Leader is, is saying and the importance of these child care centres in uh, rural Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've made record investments in this area. It hasn't been perfect. We'll continue to work with them, Mr. Speaker, and I think we can find a solution in the short term. So thank you very much. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, my concern, the concern of many of the families and parents, is that you're going to continue working with them until they close, and that's right. not good enough. Not a, it's not a new problem. This has been known for years and years. Exactly. And I've received numerous emails and calls from families with children in Mary Poppins, which is, of course, one of the centres I was just referring to. And one couple, who are both registered nurses, are having to, ba to cut back on the number of hours that they work because the infant program there closed last Friday. And, of course, this is only going to further worsen the nursing shortage. We've heard this kind of thing over and over and over again for years, but this Premier and the Minister choose to do nothing at the expense of our health care system. Another question to the Premier. Why are you deliberately making decisions that hurt our health care system? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I do appreciate uh, the question from the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, and it does talk about just how integrated all of the departments are to provide services for Islanders, and how we have to continue to help one to help the other and keep things rolling forward, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we've been doing as this government, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is no doubt there is a significant challenge in health care across Prince Edward Island, across Canada, across North America, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're not trying to shy away from that. We're trying to actually run into it, Mr. Speaker, to try to help in every way we can. Uh, I would uh, take exception to the fact that we're not trying to help these two individual uh, child care centres, Mr. Speaker, when the exact opposite is true. We'll continue to try to find a solution, Mr. Speaker, and as fast as we can find it, we will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. Well, last Friday I asked a series of questions on land development in my district of Fairview. This is a major development that's proceeded without any permitting and without any communication with the municipality, which is on the, the edge of bringing in its own land use plan, without any public consultation, none of this. Islanders are desperate for a government that, will, that is going to protect this precious island from harmful and haphazard development. Mm -hmm. To the same Premier, why isn't your government getting this done? And why does your government continue to allow development to happen without following proper process or even discussion with critical stakeholders? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think every Prince Edward Islander from tip to tip understands what a treasure we have here in this province and how hard we have to work to protect it. Uh, and I think in three and a half years, we've made incredible strides in that regard, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are challenges, as the Minister has indicated many times. There's some uh, work around the... Uh, uh, the, the, the rules and regulations that uh, need to probably be a little bit clearer, Mr. Speaker. I speak uh, daily with the Minister. Uh, he is as concerned as I am. His staff is working on making these changes, Mr. Speaker, uh, and trying to make sure everything that we do is in the best interest of Prince Edward Island, the environment of Prince Edward Island, the people of Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I think you'll hear more about that in the days ahead. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. John, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And last Wednesday, I asked questions to the Minister of Health and Wellness on the, de the delay in establishing an overdose prevention site here on PEI. Yet another thing that this government has not got done. No mental health campus, no midwifery, no electronic health records, no overdose prevention site. To the Premier, why should Islanders have confidence in this minister and in your government that has not been able to get any of these critical health care things done? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think Islanders live in the real world and they know that a lot of these things are monumental challenges that take a lot of time, Mr. Speaker, but we've actually did them, Mr. Speaker. We've actually taken them on and did them, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member talks about midwifery, for example, Mr. Speaker. Uh, midwifery program of PEI is being set up. It normally takes four years, Mr. Speaker. We've developed it in two and a half, Mr. Speaker. That's a pretty significant uh, turnaround, Mr. Speaker. That's a pretty significant turnaround, Mr. Speaker. I wish, Mr. Speaker, more so than any member in that House that I could click my fingers and get these things done, Mr. Speaker. We inherited quite a mess, Mr. Speaker. We've got most of it cleaned up, and we're on the way to getting things done, Mr. Speaker, and I think Islanders can take a lot of comfort in that. The official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'm all, I've almost run out of the number of times we've had a due date given to us for the birth of midwifery in this province. The former minister said we'd have full tip-to-tip -tip coverage in January 2020, I think it was. And here we are almost four years later and still nothing. All last night and into this morning, critically ill patients, and here I'm talking about patients who have difficulty breathing, I'm talking about patients who may have signs of cardiac arrest or stroke, critically ill patients at our main ER were waiting over 10 hours for care. This is by no means the fault of the frontline staff, they're incredible. It is the fault of an inactive government. As I read an email from one of our ER nurses last night, which I'm going to table later today, my heart broke, both for her and for her colleagues and for the patients who are waiting 10 hours or more for life-saving help. A question to the Premier. Is this the health care system that you are so proud to defend? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I am very proud to defend the people who stand on the front lines and provide these services every day, Mr. Speaker, in knowing that uh, they're in crisis, not just in the province, but across the region and across the country and across the continent, Mr. Speaker. It's not, it's not easy days in there, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's no easy button to fix health. We haven't tried to have an easy button to fix health, Mr. Speaker. We're taking the systemic challenges that are there, and we're trying to deal with them one at a time, Mr. Speaker, and we're trying to deal with them in bunches if that's what it takes to get solutions, Mr. Speaker. But I'll be the first to say it's not acceptable to have to wait that long, Mr. Speaker. We tried to institute programs like Pharmacy Plus to take some pressure off the ER system, Mr. Speaker. That's helped a little bit. It's not a magic pill. It's not a be-all and end-all. It's a little bit, and we'll keep trying to diversify the system, working with the professionals who are in the system every day, Mr. Speaker, to try to make it a little bit better for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. That's the commitment I made in 2019. That's the commitment I'll make today and every day I have the privilege to serve in this chair. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, our ERs are overrun because people with heart attacks cannot go to the pharmacy for help. Islanders were told that with this government it would be about people. People. Yet every day it's more clear that you don't care about island workers, mm -hmm. you don't care about the children of this island who will inherit accelerating climate change, and you don't care about healthcare workers who are holding our overstretched system together. Mm -hmm. So many people that you do not care about. To the Premier, why has your administration chosen to become a government that is committed to paving, that is committed to profits for off-island real estate trusts and corporations, that is committed to providing permits for rascal developers rather than a government for the people, for islanders. Well, Mr. Speaker, when he talks about climate change and adaptation, we have the most aggressive uh, uh, you know, uh, plans in the world, Mr. Speaker. We're in the great, aggressive, you know, we've done a great job there, Mr. Speaker, and we're proud of that. And we've moved from ninth to third, Mr. Speaker, in efficiency in, in, in Canada, Mr. Speaker. So we're on a good path there, Mr. Speaker. But every islander knows, every islander outside of that caucus knows, Mr. Speaker, that it's going to take time to fix these things, Mr. Speaker. And every Prince Edward Islander knows, Mr. Speaker, that you can't fix all of these issues at once. If I could fix the health care system in one failed swoop, Mr. Speaker. I would have did it on the first day I was here. We can't do that. Islanders understand that. Islanders want to know that the government is working every day to fix these challenges, to take them head on, Mr. Speaker. That's what we've done. That's what we'll continue to do, Mr. Speaker. And that's what any good government should do. Mr. Premier, the pre Premier, or sorry, Mr. Speaker, the Premier stated several times that he has full confidence in his Minister of Health. I'll tell you who doesn't have full confidence. The frontline nursing staff, the islanders sitting in the ERs, and physicians with wait, lo wait lists longer than months. Question to the Premier. I certainly hope it's not too late, but please, for the sake of islanders, will you do something to help us out of this health care crisis? The Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've been working every day since we've taken office to try to fix this situation, Mr. Speaker, but there's no simple fix, Mr. Speaker. And I know I talk to Islanders from tip to tip. Islanders are, are challenged when it comes to health care, Mr. Speaker, but they know, Mr. Speaker, that it's the health minister doesn't wake up every day, Mr. Speaker, and try to make it harder, Mr. Speaker, nor did the health minister before, the minister before, the one that will come after, Mr. Speaker. This isn't something that politics can fix, Mr. Speaker. This takes investment. It takes creativity. Activity. It takes listening to the individuals who are leaders, Mr. Speaker. People like Michael Gardham, who everyone on that side of the chair, Mr. Speaker, has chastised for doing it, Mr. Speaker. We'll take their advice, Mr. Speaker, because we're not going to get politics in the way of fixing health care. <laughs> and I have put forward solutions over the past three years because we are listening to those islanders. We asked for retention bonuses almost three years ago. We asked for child care access for frontline health care workers, Absolutely. preventative supports and basic respect of all of our health care workers. The Premier and his minister chose to wait until the even of, of an election to support our frontline health care workers and now we're in extreme, in extreme trouble because you fumbled the football here, Premier. Oh, yeah. Question to the Premier, how can Islanders trust that you'll actually lead us out of this health care crisis when you, can, when you only take action on the lead up to an election? 
Mr. Speaker, I've never seen a party so focused on election as this party across here, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, we're working every day, Mr. Speaker, with the mandate we've been given by Islanders to deliver for Islanders. And I would say in response to the question from the Honourable Member across, Mr. Speaker, I think Islanders can have faith that we can find these solutions because we're the only party in here, Mr. Speaker, who doesn't care about the politics of it. We're looking for solutions. <laughs> from this government. The Minister of Health promised diabetes advocates yesterday that yep. he would do a ministerial statement for diabetes yep. map, which ended yesterday. Out of the nine ministerial statements yesterday, Diabetes Month was not one of them. It was actually pulled from the list. It got a 10-second shout-out from, from the minister during greetings instead. You know what a green government would have announced yesterday? A green government would have announced that we were going to remove the cap, the age cap off insulin pumps. We would have removed those and we would have funded amputation prevention methods, which this government has ignored for the last four years. That's what we would have funded. This side of, the, of this house believes that one islander every eight months having an amputation because of diabetes is unethical and inhumane and unacceptable. That's why we would have announced those. Question to the Premier. With all the promises flying around yesterday, why didn't any of them include the long-awaited diabetes supports? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot to unravel there, I can tell you that, and I don't know what the Honourable Member thinks in here, Mr. Speaker, but it's the people of Prince Edward Island who select governments, Mr. Speaker. It's not your caucus, Mr. Speaker, so you can wish and will all you want. The people will have an opportunity at some point in 2023 to cast their vote, Mr. Speaker, and choose their government, and they will choose on a variety of things, Mr. Speaker, and we'll let people decide that, not you. RSV and COVID are running rampant in, uh, here in Prince Edward Island. Our children are the ones that be, are being infected the most, and there's no sign of this slowing down anytime soon. We've seen patients die in ERs in other jurisdictions because of long wait times. And I'll be tabling the wait times of our ER over the last two days because it is appalling. 81 people in our, in our ER last night. I'll tell you what else a Green government would have announced yesterday. We would have announced reopening the cold and fever clinic so people didn't have to go to the ER when they didn't have an emergency, which is what this government wants them to do today. So question to the Premier. You didn't seem to have any big announcements to keep our ERs up and running. Are you waiting for an Islander to die in the, in the emergency room, room waiting rooms before you'll actually address the crisis in our ERs? So, Mr. Speaker, I hope Islanders are watching because what I'm hearing is what a Green government would do would be what they want to do, and they wouldn't listen to any of the professionals, Mr. Speaker, that provide the advice, Mr. Speaker. We don't walk in and tell the professionals to open up a clinic, Mr. Speaker. We listen to them. They look at the resources that are there, and they try to disperse them to the best they can, Mr. Speaker. And by my count, Mr. Speaker, just now that I'm up on the floor, because I made a note of this, that at least on 10 occasions, what I have heard from the leader of the opposition and from his party is that they wouldn't have listened to Dr. Morrison when it comes to doing things, Mr. Speaker, during COVID, Mr. Speaker. They know better. They know better than Dr. Morrison, Mr. Speaker. Through Fiona, Mr. Speaker, when Tanya Mullally and all the professionals were leading us through the most difficult time in 100 years, Mr. Speaker, there were seven occasions when the Green Party said they wouldn't listen to Tanya Mullally, that they know better, Mr. Speaker. I don't know better than the professionals, Mr. Speaker. I've taken their advice every second I've been in this job, and I'll take it every second I'm in the job. I hope Islanders are listening to what the the alternative over there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pretty sure that CPHO is telling you that workers need to stay home when they're sick, but you didn't listen to that advice. Mr. Speaker, tens 
of thousands of island workers woke up this morning no longer having access to emergency leave when sick and the job protection that comes with it. This will not only force sick workers back to work, it will prevent them from being able to follow Dr. Morrison's advice to stay home when they're sick at a time when respiratory illnesses are threatening to collapse our ER capacity. The minister hasn't done anything to prevent this situation. So I'm going to ask the premier, will cabinet immediately amend the Employment Standards Act regulations to specify that a COVID-19 infection is a circumstance that qualifies a worker for emergency leave and job protection under the act? So, Mr. Speaker, as we've been saying from the beginning, Mr. Speaker, that we would keep this in place until such time as the Act gets uh, uh, actual uh, uh, collaboration from all parties involved, Mr. Speaker, and we come up with a good long-term solution, not just pick a number out of a hat, Mr. Speaker, for what the day should be. So the answer to that question is not only yes, it was done at 6 o'clock this morning. Well, I am glad to hear that something was done. It was like pulling teeth, my goodness. line to do what needs to be done for workers but you know you did a little something there but I'd like to add something else here then premier for you to consider like the minister this side of the house is also hearing that some island workers are not getting supported while sick because their employers are refusing to apply to the special leave fund this is shameful and entirely preventable a question to the Premier. Will you permit all island workers to apply directly to the special leave fund to ensure that island workers are financially supported when they stay home while sick, just as Dr. Morrison has asked? Mr. Speaker, if there's any island worker out there that finds themselves in that solution, you should call the Minister's office and we'll help you through it here. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, back in October, which feels a really long time ago, I asked the Minister of Finance when we could expect the fall economic update. He advised it was being worked on and would be released soon. I'm pretty sure that with the flurry of announcements yesterday, we can be sure that that update includes a healthy surplus of cash. Yes, Question to the Minister of Finance. Soon is now much, much later. Where's the fall economic update? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, I agree. It does need to come. Obviously, it did put us behind by a week or so. I would remind the member, too, that uh, there's a lot of spending, obviously, in the last few months with Fiona and uh, inflationary support. So we look forward to uh, bringing the federal fiscal update uh, and, uh, and finalizing it in the next coming days. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. In early November, the Minister of Social Development and Housing stated during debate on the capital budget, then again in response to a question and question period, that government is working on a support package to help landlords facing increased operating costs this winter, and that something would be coming out this week. And this is after the Minister froze the rent increase for 2023. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing, when will you be delivering on your commitment for a support package for landlords? Honourable yeah, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My understanding, uh, it is going to Treasury Board either today or tomorrow, and uh, CCOP for, for approval, and uh, should be announced any day. Don't believe of the third party. Well, there's one more only one more day left in this week, as, as my calendar indicates, so <laughs> we'll, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Mr. Speaker, we've seen that the government cannot follow through on their commitments to build government-operated affordable housing in the timelines they provide. Until they can, we need to partner with private developments, developers and not burn bridges. We need a balance. Question to the Minister. How can we expect the private sector to help solve our housing crisis if we refuse to address the issues they are bringing forward in response to your government's recent decisions? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, over the course of this last couple of months, not only have I met with the Landlord Association, Mr. Speaker, but numerous developers. Uh, we've got numerous developers uh, ready to uh, start their projects, uh, Mr. Speaker, and they're very excited on the 2%. Uh, one thing I've learned through this whole process, Mr. Speaker, is 
not every landlord is part of the Landlord Association, Mr. Speaker, and uh, a lot of things that are, are being said in the Landlord Association meetings is not necessarily what other landlords are saying, Mr. Speaker. Now, one thing I have come to, to realize too, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Landlord uh, Association Rep, Chris LeClaire, uh, that is a good friend of, of uh, the, the third party, uh, I come to find out uh, he's no longer a registered lobbyist, Mr. Speaker. I haven't been able to meet with him. It expired last January, so if you could let him know next time you see him to renew his uh, uh, membership, and I'll get back to you. Donegal Leader of the Third Party, or Second Supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another decision, another decision that confuses me is one the Minister spoke about yesterday regarding Causeway Bay Hotel in Summerside. The Minister stated that the owners gave them a number that was too high for government to purchase the building. Mm -hmm. Well, his boss has said in here repeatedly that money's not an issue, and you know, he could have offered them a little a different uh, amount and gave them some uh, gift cards and some uh, Denny dollars if he wanted to. Question to the Minister. Typically in negotiations, you don't back away after the first offer. Why didn't you provide a counteroffer? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, one thing that this government takes quite pride in is uh, not throwing away money uh, when it's not needed. Now, we've certainly seen the previous administration have numerous scandals when it comes to money, Mr. Speaker, and uh, this is one that, uh, that just didn't work. It wouldn't make sense to the taxpayers. Uh, it was double of, uh, of what the price should have been, Mr. Speaker, and we just weren't prepared to do it. Larry Infamous. I know the Minister of Health hasn't had many questions yet today, Mr. Speaker, so I'm going to give him a go here. The staffing issues in our public health care system continue to be in the shambles, but our private long-term care staffing shortage is also in a critical state. Staff are often paid less, have less benefits, and are also working under unsafe protocols. In 2020, the Department of Health and Wellness formed a committee task force to work with private nursing homes to address staffing challenges. Question to the Minister of Health. Can you provide this House an update of the work of this committee and what specific objectives it's currently working on? Health and Wellness. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do uh, thank uh, the Honourable Member, my colleague from the western part of the province, for uh, the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over the last two and a half years, you look at uh, staff right within the department, uh, the amount that they have hit on their plate. But, Mr. Speaker, I do have to say that staff in the department, they are continuously in, uh, working with uh, the owner-operators of their long-term care facilities uh, to meet as much as possible the needs uh, of those facilities, and we will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank Larry you. Inverness. Well, that's interesting, Mr. Speaker. He's formed a committee. They're out working hard on behalf of Islanders, Mr. Speaker. But I can't imagine this committee is actually accomplishing very much this day, because I hear that a lot of them have resigned, Mr. Oh. Speaker. The McLeod Group of Nursing Homes, Atlantic Baptist, Dr. John Gillis Memorial Lodge, which I think was in the uh, Minister of Agriculture's riding, and the PEI Seniors Group have all resigned from this group. Well, will the Minister of Health confirm to this House that they did so because of government failing to recognize the health professionals in our private system for retention initiatives? Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. You know, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we heard ones from the third party over there basically saying that they had no faith in our NGOs, that they felt that we shouldn't be working with our NGOs. Here we have, here we have another member from the third party basically blasting, basically casting doubt on the ability, on the hard work ethic that we have within the Department of Health and Wellness, within staff within the Department of Health and Wellness, that go to, day, uh, go to work day in, day out to make life and to work with these organizations. It's, I, I just, I find it hard to believe just how the third party, their attitude towards NGOs and towards our hardworking staff. <laughs> Second supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the minister's got it all wrong. It's not, it's not about the lack of respect. It's that, that this group has no respect for this government is the issue. <laughs> These are hardworking private operators out there and, and the PEI Seniors Group Home that are working towards this, Mr. Speaker. The group's voice uh, government collaborated in bad faith 
about not informing them of their intention incentives and being announced days after the last committee meeting of October 11th. So not a lot of respect showed there, Mr. Speaker. Question the Minister of Health. These emails are clear on where they stand on the issue and have lost trust in your government. What are you doing to fix this relationship with our private nursing home operators and providing a service we desperately need and get their contract signed, Mr. Speaker? Uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and unlike the third party that uh, does not respect NGOs, does not respect staff, he may, the honourable member may insinuate that I do not, that I do not respect and really deeply appreciate the great work. Minister has the floor. Minister has the floor. Unlike, uh, to reiterate, the third party no, no. who has no respect for NGOs, no respect for frontline staff, Mr. Speaker, it does appear that they do have respect for our long-term care, private nursing homes, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, that is the one thing that I do share with the honorable member, is that respect for an appreciation for our private long-term uh, nursing homes. And I will continue to work with them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I've talked before about the many subdivision developments uh, out in the central part of the island that's in, in my area. And, of course, uh, whether they're in an unincorporated area, which there is a lot of, and whether they're in, uh, in a municipality, they all need uh, sewer and water and, and roads. And, and um, you know, ideally, centralized sewer and water is, is a good thing. In fact, I was talking to one subdivision uh, developer who said they're, they're having to increase the price of their lots by $50,000 each just to put the sewer and water and roads. And that's, that's septic beds and um, wells and roads that uh, are, not, are not government owned. So even, even places um, where they're near centralized sewer and water, uh, municipalities lack the funding needed to, to connect new subdivisions to that, like Northwest Go Harbor, or there's a couple in Cavendish Resort Municipality. So, um, I was thinking about who, what minister to ask this to, whether it's uh, transportation, infrastructure, community fisheries, but I think it's the Department of Land that makes the policy. So, I'd like to ask the Minister of Land. Uh, how will your department support and encourage centralized sewer and water solutions in new and existing subdivisions? The Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Land. Uh, Honorable Member, that is a good question. Um, we're right now working <laughs> to get over a number of hurdles with permits and land, and uh, we, know, we know we do need housing, we need more housing, and uh, we'll do our very best to work with municipalities to ensure that they have the infrastructure in place that they need. Thank you. Rustical Emerald. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, Irene, uh, there was an a operating budget, uh, and in the address, they talked about a municipal housing fund. Uh, you know, the, it was, we are establishing a $5 million fund with the Federation of Municipalities to work with municipalities to prepare lots for construction-ready po uh, projects. That included roadways, utilities like sewer and water and site work. But $5 million is not a lot of money, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to those sort of infrastructure projects. Um, as well. I know that the federal government has a housing accelerator fund that's to include support such as uh, upfront funding for investments in municipal housing planning. Um, so I, my question to the Minister of Land is, what is the status of the municipal housing fund and is there a potential to grow this fund to better achieve its objectives? Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That fund has actually been uh, put over to the Federation PEI municipalities, and they're actually working on the guidelines and the procedures for that fund so municipalities can apply so that they can upgrade uh, their infrastructure as it applies to new developments. Thank you. Rustical Emerald, your second supplementary. Well, that's great to hear because we need to connect our, our developments to central sewer and water. We need to get good roads in there, and we need to do that for existing subdivisions as well. Um, now, Outside of municipalities, Mr. Speaker, often there's little transparency as to what developments are occurring. We heard the leader of the official opposition talk a little bit about that today. Uh, for example, the current process only allows consideration of submissions from any property owners within 100 meters of any proposed subdivision. This is the, the Planning Act uh, um, for Subdivision and Development Regulations, right? Uh, 
so this doesn't work well, Mr. Speaker, in, in rural unincorporated areas. Because there's no land use plan, it's not clear what is being considered for the area as a whole. In fact, it's not even clear how the area as a whole is considered. So um, we need some solutions. You know, maybe the local MLA could be identified or consulted. But my question to the Minister of Land is, what options are you considering to improve this process with respect to transparency, land use planning, and public engagement? Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Land. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, uh, it's one of my, uh, I guess, my biggest goals as Minister of Land is to clarify and streamline that process and work with both uh, transportation and environment to ensure that uh, we can do what Islanders need in a timely fashion. But I will say, through the construction, construction boom, we have uh, been able to process uh, applications quicker. And I'll also point out that we do not have a land use plan in PEI, and that's something that keeps coming up. And it's something that I will continue to work on. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> and I'll also point out that uh, other provinces like Ontario and Alberta, they've got wait times of 100 days and they do have a land use plan. Halifax has 47 days. So we're averaging around 20. We'll continue to do the work that we need to do and it definitely is on my radar and I thank the member for the question. Rush to call Emerald. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've spoken a few times this session about shoreline protection for, for residents being impacted by erosion and, and climate change. Now, in my district, Mr. Speaker, there's definitely two groups of people I, I hear from. Uh, one are people who are really concerned about the impacts of shoreline armoring and work in the buffer zone. You know, things like the Point de Roche is a big example that's brought up even in my district. And then there's a group of people who live on the shoreline and own property. They're really in, uh, worried about the impacts of erosion and climate change and what they can do to safely and effectively protect their property and investments. Uh, so this is a question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, what are we doing as a province to balance the needs and concerns of these two groups of people? Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So therein lies the problem. <laughs> the, uh, on, we do have two very different sides. We have one side, well, the Green Party, for example, who didn't know we could work in the buffer zone until, uh, until this session and uh, don't want people to. And then we have other people who think that we need to have some protection in, in the buffer zone. So. Uh, I guess my job is to, to find a policy using experts that we can protect the shorelines of Prince Edward Island to make sure that we're going to be here tomorrow, that we, have, that we leave Prince Edward Island here for, for a future without doing something that goes uh, drastically against the natural uh, look and feel of Prince Edward Island and obviously doesn't block beaches and those sorts of things. So uh, my plan is to sit down with experts uh, uh, starting tomorrow and work on a policy for the spring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Cole Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do fully appreciate that this is, this is a, a, a challenging um, task. And I do know, however, we can't keep uh, kicking this down the road. And I know the minister is working hard, listening to the experts, and is passionate about finding a solution to this as well. Um, so a question to the Minister of, of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. You know, what sort of options are we realistically considering as we go forward? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I talked about it a couple times this session about uh, development zones where the rules may be different in different areas based on the speed of the speed of erosion, uh, based on the, the slope, a number of factors that we may have a bigger buffer zone in some areas than others if it's if it's necessary. But really like to work that out. And I my understanding is the Climate School at UPI has a lot of the mapping work done. So I'm I'm. Uh, uh, looking forward to seeking their help, help on this. I've, I've sought it. I'll, I'll have it uh, here shortly. Um, but I think the, the thing I, I do want to touch on is the, there was over 570 applications to work in the buffer zone in, in 2021, and they they were a had a variety of, of things from floating docks to stairs to to shoreline protection to in some cases looking to to remove trees. So we we. W we know that there's a big need out there. There's a lot of ask out there for people wanting to do things. Uh, what we have to do is make sure that we do it in a way that, that protects Prince Edward Island and does it as, as, as natural and native as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Colano, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there and, and people wondering how they're gonna, gonna proceed. Um, you know, part of this conversation was around what kind of work, if any, would be permitted to be done within the buffer zone as they repair from Fiona damage and just going forward in the future. Um, 
I mean, we've heard, we've heard this this option about the possibility for a moratorium on development work within a buffer zone area. You know, at least until the experts have some time to weigh in and provide a a path forward that that is agreeable to, and is that balance that uh, that was referred to in the previous question. So, a question to the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action: Where do you stand on this idea of a moratorium, and is something like that feasible? Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So. <clears throat> I guess I, you know, I'm going to want to approach this very, very cautiously. The, there are people who had damage from in Fiona who have um, their family homes <clears throat> in a very precarious situation if we were to get another storm. So I wouldn't want to bring in measures that would prevent them from being able to bring the protection that they need, need to. Um, I'm very concerned about that. I'm getting concerns from uh, companies who do work in the buffer zone, who are all very good, upstanding companies. They're all Islanders. They they coach hockey teams. They they go to church. They do. They're all part of our community, so they're not bad people. But what they're scared is through the fall session that they've been painted as bad people for doing work in the buffer zone, which they're not. They they've done it with our permission. Um, some of them are very worried about going back and doing any more work. And I know there's a substantial amount of repair work that needs to be done post Fiona to help protect some places, particularly in. The honourable members riding in the Rustico area, there's a lot there. So I want to be very careful about uh, bringing in a moratorium that would prevent us from being able to do those things. I'd want to be very careful about doing a moratorium that would disallow people from putting stairs down to the, the, their beach so they can enjoy it and things like that. But what I will commit to, Mr. Speaker, is this. There will be a moratorium in place on any new development on the shoreline until we get this policy right. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the minister responsible for the status of women spoke about how pleased she was to participate in a meeting on a national action plan to end gender-based violence. However, the document released was not what advocates had been hoping for. All of the actions in it are optional, so how much of a difference this actually will make to Islanders really is up to this government and what they choose to do with it. To the minister responsible for the status of women, what actions do you intend to champion going forward? Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it was certainly a historical moment um, as I joined my federal, provincial and territorial colleagues from across the country to sign on to the first ever national action plan. Mr. Speaker, the plan is, is fairly broad and um, certainly there is a lot of leeway uh, to, that will allow the provinces to sort of make, find solutions that are specific to their areas. So, Mr. Speaker, what I'm looking forward to doing is, is speaking to stakeholders, um, speaking to government departments, and um, finding out what the needs are here on PEI and working with the federal government on the final agreement. And I'm, I understand that it's a significant amount of money that will be um, allocated to Prince Edward Island, and I really am looking forward to the projects and programs and supports that are going to um, come to fruition as a result of those dollars. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the minister is years into this mandate. I'm very distressed to hear that she doesn't yet know what the needs are mm -hmm. on this. this the third pillar in this framework is on justice. I have heard from a few women lately who have left abusive relationships and are finding the justice system is making them even more unsafe. One person told me that her ex fired his lawyer and decided to self-represent and then started contacting her lawyer constantly with demands, none of which were reasonable, but all of which required an enormous amount of time on the lawyer's part. Question to the Minister of Justice, can you guess who got billed for all those yes. legal fees. Yeah. Yeah. To guess who paid the legal be fees, but I will say that we continue to expand our uh, staffing to ensure that we do have what we need there for Islanders. I'm sorry, Walmart. I don't even know what that was supposed to mean, but I will tell you who paid the legal fees. It she, all got billed to her lawyer absolutely. because he doesn't have a lawyer anymore. He's self-representing. So it's hard to imagine, but her ex, who now has no legal fees, is deliberately running hers through the roof. Wow. And this is in no That's way, so this is just a new way that he can control her. She's got a good job, but her resources are not limitless, and her ex knows that well. Yep. To the Minister of Justice, what protections are there for people whose controlling ex-partners are determined to use the legal system to spend all their money? Good question. Uh, 
thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, Honourable Member. I, I, I believe I'm quoting you saying that justice, access to justice means many things to many people, and <coughs> we have a number of different programs across government. Um, the department does excellent work to be there for Islanders, and we'll continue to do that. We've expanded our, our, our staffing, uh, expanded our number of lawyers, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot, final question. Mr. Speaker, all of these programs that the minister speaks of vaguely, none of them apply in this situation, no, and you should know that by now. This a serious gap because eventually you run out of choice. Access to the children, division of assets, yeah. child support, none of which is over until her ex says it's over and in the meantime her legal bills keep going through the roof. We both know legal aid is so underfunded that they are not able to help with this and you have no interest in expanding the scope of who has access to it. Question to the Minister of Justice. So instead, what are you going to do to make sure that no mother loses access to their children, her assets and her dignity at the hands of her controlling ex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Member. I, I agree that that's not acceptable. Um, we are working in the department to do what we can for everyone. Uh, we'll increase the budgeting for, for uh, legal aid. And we'll Minister has the floor. Uh, Honorable Member, you can send all your suggestions to me. I'd be happy to listen to them and we'll uh, discuss them in the department. Thank you. End of question period. Statements by ministers? The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker, in the 2021 speech from the throne, our government committed to being equitable and inclusive by creating new programs that give underrepresented populations more recognition and support. One of these programs is the gender equity, diversity, inclusion, and community enhancement program. Earlier this fall, our department launched the program and invited groups from across the province to apply with projects that would make Prince Edward Island a more inclusive province. Mr. Speaker, today I'm proud to announce that we have funded 24 projects for a total of a half a million dollars. The funded groups and projects are now available on our government's website. Mr. Speaker, I know there's too many good projects to list them all here today, but uh, I would like to give an example of a few. The PEI Transgender Network received funding for their project, Breaking the System. With this funding, they will hold a three-day event celebrating International Transgender Day of Visibility. And Mr. Speaker, another project is with Sport PEI, their project called Building True Sports Across PEI where they will develop safe train, sport training and true sport ambassador program. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed to ensuring that all Islanders feel a sense of belonging. These projects are just one way of working to achieve that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's certainly very good to see that uh, there is investment in gender and equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, and building our communities. It's uh, 24 projects is, is certainly good to hear, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing more details about all of these projects and the incredible work that, that I'm sure that these groups will do um, toward these goals. I will just say that, you know, this is, sounds like a very good start. As a new, uh, new fund, I would encourage government to uh, connect with all of those organizations, uh, you know, throughout this project as well as at the end to make sure that it's, it's working for them in the way that they need it to, um, so that if adjustments need to be made in the future that that's taken into consideration. Um, we have quite a wide range of, of different groups that are, are uh, that this fund is striving to support, uh, which is good to see but also it's a very there's always the risk that uh, we might lose sight of, uh, of helping uh, some some groups uh, you know when we have such a, a broad scope so uh, you know I do encourage uh, government to continue to work with those organizations and it is it is certainly good to see that uh, NGOs are, are receiving support to do this important work thank you mr. speaker thank you um, uh, minister for the announcement I think it's uh, it's important and I'll, I'll have a look I'll have a detailed look at that that list and see what the projects are but we have to we have to keep going and we, we've talked about this I've talked with the former minister and I've talked with a lot of ministers across the board we have issues in our province around around this and 
Um, you, you need not look any further than the report that was tabled to the Standing Committee on, uh, on, on health and social development that we have, we have some issues around this. And we can't stop and, and we, we can say this is a good announcement and it's there, but it doesn't stop the work that we need to do in the very near future. And it doesn't stop what has to be done to build equity. Equity is the process, inclusion is the goal. And we are not, we, we, we have a lot of work to do, and we will. And I'm saying that in, in, in respect to, I think that you want to learn, Minister, and, and, and we want to get better at this, we want to get better at this together. So today is a, is a good announcement. Um, we just can't keep our, we have to keep our foot on the pedal and make sure that, that we change, and we change in this chamber, that we change in the kitchen tables, and we change all across Prince Edward Island. So thank you for this announcement today, and we'll keep going. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statements. S presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the email I received, uh, along with others, from an ER nurse at the QEH. And I move, seconded by Summerside Wilmot, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. Yeah. The Honourable mm -hmm. Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, a current uh, data survey on the um, data from the Canadian Blood Services, which shows the current percentage of infection, COVID infection in blood donors in just one month in PEI. Spoiler, 67 percent, Mr. Speaker. And by, um, um, seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlton Victoria Park. Shirley Carey. Carey. O'Leary Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of this House, I beg to table emails obtained through a Freedom of Information request sent by the Department of Health and Wellness from the McLeod Group of Nursing Homes, the Atlantic Baptist Nursing Home, Dr. John Gillis Memorial Lodge, withdrawing their membership from the PEI Private Nursing Home Task Force set up by this government, and a subsequent email in response to this by the Director of Recruitment and Retention of the Department of Health and Wellness, and I move seconded by Charlotte and West Roy that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Garrett. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> by leaving the House. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, the CPHO data on lab-confirmed influenza here in PEI 2022-2023 season, and uh, it will show that our, our lab-confirmed influenza is already well above the five-year rolling average two months before it peaked in any other year. And I, uh, and I move seconded by Charlton Victoria Park that the said table be now received and do lie on the table. Sheila Carey. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, a screenshot of the um, QEH wait times in the ER for December 1st, this morning at 11.30, which shows that there's 68 people in the emergency department, and uh, four at the most urgent, and all of them are waiting over 10 hours in order to get um, somebody to help them, and obviously not because of the front line. Thank you. And uh, I move seconded by Victoria, Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shirley Carey. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table another um, another screenshot on the um, current of the status of the QEH emergency room department. This one's from November 30th, last night at 8:30, and it shows that there was 81 people in the emergency room last night, and there were nine people that were most urgent, all of which would be waiting more than 10 hours in order to get service. And I move seconded by. Um, the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shirley Carey. Carey. Did I miss anyone? Okay, reports by committees. Introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move by, <coughs> seconded by the Honorable Premier that the 11th, 15th, 16th orders of the day be now read. 
Second, sir. Charlotte Carey. Here, here. Order number 11, an act to amend the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, Bill number 79, ordered for third reading. Order number 15, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2022, Bill number 89, ordered for third reading. Order 16, Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2023, Bill number 88, ordered for third reading. Order 17, Loan Act 2022, Bill number 84, ordered for third reading. Who's the last one? What number? Bill 84. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the said bills be read a third time. Shall I carry? Bill number 79, an act to amend the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, read a third time. Bill number 89, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2022, read a third time. Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2023, Bill number 88, read a third time. Bill number 84, Loan Act 2022, read a third time. Shut up, cat. Oh. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move a second by the Honorable Premier that the said bills do now pass. Honorable members, these bills introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to the committee of the whole House. Reported, reported, agreed to, with and without amendment. As the case may be, read a third time, it is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favor say yay. yay. Contrary, nay. Honorable Minister, Premier, Deputy Premier, bill's passed. Ready? The Honorable, you guys ready? The Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to advise that this concludes the business that government wishes to conduct this fall setting. Honorable, me Honorable members, I've been advised that the Honorable Lieutenant Governor will be arriving at the Honorable George Coles building shortly. I will now leave the chair to invite her to join us in the chamber to receive the House and grant royal assent to the various bills passed in the House.
Your Honor, the Legislative Assembly has passed certain bills during this, the second session of the 66th General Assembly, and now begs Your Honor's consideration of the grant of royal assent to the following bills. An Act to Amend the Grain Elevators Act, Bill No. 45. An Act to Amend the Public Sector Pension Plan Act, Bill No. 53. An Act to Amend the Education Act No. 2, Bill No. 57. An Act to Amend the Workers' Compensation Act No. 2, Bill No. 68. Notaries and Commissioners Act, Bill No. 72. An Act to Amend the Municipal Government Act, Bill No. 73. Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, No. 2, Bill No. 75. An Act to Amend the Early Learning and Child Care Act, Bill No. 76. An Act to Amend the Registry Act, Bill No. 77. An Act to Amend the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, Bill No. 79. An Act to Amend the Rental of Residential Property Act, No. 2, Bill No. 80. Gasoline Tax Act, Bill No. 81. Loan Survey Act, Bill No. 82. Loan Act 2022, Bill No. 84. An Act to Amend the Income Tax Act, No. 2, Bill No. 85. An Act to Amend the Plant Health Act, Bill No. 86. Residential Tenancy Act, Bill No. 87. Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2022, Bill No. 89. An Act to Amend the Election Act No. 2, Bill No. 120. An Act to Amend the Legislative Assembly Act, Bill No. 126. In His Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. May it please, Your Honor, we, His Majesty, loyal and dutiful subjects of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island and Sessions Assembled, approach Your Honor at close of our labors with sentiments of unified devotions and loyalty to His Majesty, person, and government. We do humbly beg of Your Honor's acceptance of the following bills entitled Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2023. Thus placing at the disposal of the Crown the means of which government can be made efficient for the service and welfare of the province. Her Honor. The Honorable Lieutenant Governor doth thank His Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects, accepts their benevolence, and assents to this bill in His Majesty's name. I wish to commend the Honorable Members for the conscientious manner in which you have conducted your deliberations to this point of the second session of the 66th General Assembly of Prince Edward Island. Je tiens à vous exprimer ma reconnaissance pour votre dévouement au bien-être de tous les insulaires. At this time, I pray that until the Legislative Assembly again meets, each of you enjoy good health and prosperity, and that peace and freedom for all people shall be more nearly achieved. And I wish to uh, extend to you my Christmas greeting. En ce Noël, puissent les expressions de gratitude et des actes de bonté vous donnent l'espoir d'une nouvelle année saine et prospère. This Christmas, may expressions of gratitude and acts of kindness give you hope for a healthy and a prosperous new year. Thank you. Sergeant Arms. <coughs> the Honorable Member from Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that this House adjourn and stand to the call of the Speaker. Honorable Members, before 
call in the question. I'd just like to say a few words. I'll, I'm not going to keep everybody long because I know everybody wants to get out and start the Christmas shopping. <laughs> I've heard that for the last three weeks now. When are we going to get out and do our Christmas shopping? But I just want to, now is my time to thank everybody. And I'd like to thank uh, staff on all floors. Uh, they're great to get along with, uh, great to chat with, uh, understand all the issues and what we're all going through. Uh, the, the, the staff in, in the office of the Legislative Assembly, far better than none to work with. Like, they're just excellent. They uh, guide me through, uh, make me look good, uh, dress me. Some of them. Some and of them. <laughs> some of them. Joanne, yeah, she's uh, so it, you know it's just it's just a great working environment here in the legislative assembly on all floors. And members, to you too, a big huge thank you too, because not every day up here I'm perfect, and you fellows also make me look good when there's mistakes made. You, uh, I make a mistake, you definitely let me know, but you let me away with it. So we all make mistakes and that's how we uh, learn in here and we grow in here. And as you've seen in the, in the, since November, November 1st, the, the work that has been done in here for Islanders, there's debate back and forth, but at the same time, <coughs> when we get to the kitchen, it's, we're, we're all, make it look good make ourselves look good. But anyway, I just want everybody, Christmas is coming upon us. Take this time of year to spend with family and friends at Christmas time, as much time as you can. I know we all leave, live uh, busy lives because I, I live it myself, but make sure you take your time for your family and your friends. It's the most important thing you can do. Honorable members, Shirley Carey. Let's get to the kitchen. I'm not worried which floor.